From the moment automakers added the first computer, your car began producing data. And though it didn't seem important then, today, with electronics running virtually everything in our vehicles, companies want to turn that data into money. But what is data? Who owns it? And is it secure? That discussion on today's edition of AutoLine This Week. And now, here's your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week. You know, the automotive industry is facing massive disruption, whether we're talking things like autonomous cars, ride sharing and car sharing, what they call mobility services. This industry is going to go upside down, but there could be a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and they call it data monetization. How do you make money off all the data coming out of cars? And we're going to get into that today because I got three terrific guests to join me in that discussion, including Jennifer Dukarski, a lawyer from Butzel Long. We can't get into this discussion without a lawyer at the table. Mike Perugi is with a company called Axiom. These guys are brilliant at collecting data and protecting it, and we're going to get into that. And Sam Abulsamid is a researcher with Navigant Research. I want to thank all three of you for sitting at the table here today with me. Thanks for having me, John. John. Uh, Mike, why don't I throw out to you, but I want the other two to chime in on this. There's talk that this data monetization idea, monetizing the data in cars, could be worth anywhere from $450 billion, maybe $750 billion by the year 2030. In automotive terms, that's just a couple of design cycles away. Do you think the market could be that big? Uh, it could be that big, frankly, if the auto companies do their due diligence. And the due diligence is basically to set up their data so that it can be ingested into the system and used as an actual asset. And that's part of, and, and forgive me for throwing the plug in here, but that is truly one of the things that we look at when a company comes to us for that sole purpose of, of monetizing their data. Yeah, Sam, your ideas on this? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, <coughs> reaching those kinds of revenue numbers are, are absolutely possible. You know, uh, there's all kinds of potential services that could be built off of the data that's being generated by cars uh, and aggregating that data and providing services back to consumers. And especially if we start to move into more mobility as a service, where people are spending are not spending their time driving the vehicles, but they're they're just in the vehicles and consuming various services, then there's all kinds of possibilities. But we also have to make sure it gets done right. Security is going to be key. Privacy, you know, how how that data is handled, especially personally identifiable information. Yeah, and we'll talk about that all sure show, show long, I'm sure. But Jennifer, we don't want it, Equifax in the. In yeah, the <laughs> that's right. This is going to be a big market. The car industry Absolutely. can make a fortune off this. Without a doubt, I, I can't go anywhere and not be asked by people who are way outside the automotive industry. How do I get into this? I've been asked by media companies. I've been asked by consumer. You know, companies. Everybody wants a bite. Yeah. Mike, what kind of data are we talking about, just so the audience understands? Sure. Well, <clears throat> there's, there's a number of ways data is actually put out by a vehicle. Uh, obviously, the first piece of data is when you purchase the vehicle itself, your name, address, city, state, and so on. Your second phase of that uh, data has to do with the financial information that also gets generated when you either lease a vehicle or finance a vehicle. But when you get into the vehicle itself, it could go up to about 60 key areas of, of a vehicle. And part of those areas could do anything from like the road condition sensors to uh, the vehicle distance sensors to even air pressure uh, and even the tire monetizations. So each individual vehicle is uh, in and of itself is putting out uh, a number of different megabytes over a period of time. And there was a study that was done by uh, Ford uh, back a few years ago that about 10 terabytes of data can be pulled from a vehicle daily. And if you look at the differences... 10 terabytes! <laughs> 10 terabytes. Well, if you're looking at an automated yeah. vehicle with all the sensors on there, yeah, they, sure. they, they're generating up to 4 terabytes an hour mm -hmm. of data. Uh, and I mean, most of that data is not going to be useful outside of the vehicle. Most of it is only useful in real time for control. But still, there's a lot of data that you can extract from the vehicle to, to build on. Okay, and how do you make money off it? Um, 
Well, the near term, probably the thing we're probably looking at the most is things like lead generation for various types of services, like maintenance services, parking. Uh, Ford's already uh, launched their their Ford Pass system last year, uh, where they're they're working with parking providers to tell drivers, you know, um, where there's available parking and allow them to reserve a parking space and pay for it. And you know, I'm sure a cut of that payment for the parking is going back to Ford as part of that part of that platform. Uh, maintenance, you know, when you need service on your vehicle and it reminds you, hey, there's a there's a, an oil change deal at this dealership down the road. Would you like to schedule an appointment? A cut of that is probably going back to the manufacturer. So that's that's the near term and then longer term things like uh, the data that's collected uh, that gets fed into mapping and, and navigation systems to, to generate the high definition maps for automated vehicles. That there's there's going to be revenue from that as well. Jennifer, now we got to talk the legal aspect of this. When I talk to friends and family about this trend coming, mm -hmm. they go, I don't want my data going out. <laughs> I don't want this getting shared. I don't want other people making money off it. How's the industry going to handle this? Well, the industry is going to handle it by first taking a look at the different laws that are involved. And, and to be honest with you, right now, there's very little in terms of um, restrictions on, on the personal data that you can collect and you can use, uh, especially when you have the contracts there in place where the, the people who buy a car are almost, in essence, assigning away the right for their data to be used in almost any capacity. But they don't even know that, right? And, and that's, yeah, and that's It's pages of pages and you're buying a car and you're signing, you want to get out of there, Absolutely. you want to get in the shiny new car and now you just signed away all your data. And that's why so many countries, so many states are taking a look at legislation that will specifically require or mandate kind of a notification, a transparency. And you look really on a more global scale at the ethical implications of that data. There are several different groups that have come out with ethical principles that they're hoping regulation will be based on. If you look at IEEE, uh, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, uh, they came out with a study that had a lot of principles on what should go with your data and where, where you should be allowed to, to send your data without permission. I mean, when you jump into a car, if you're even um, Ubering, do you, do you give that car the right to track the GPS location of where you are and where you're going? I mean, you might like it, you might know where the next nearest Starbucks is, but are you the one who's actually making the choice to give that data and send it over? The principle would be transparency, uh, the ability to choose when your data is released and not released, and a commitment to security to make sure that data is protected from unintended individuals receiving it. Okay, let's talk to the guy from the data company. Mike, how do you guys handle this very well, thing? Well, you're, you're already collecting a ton we're, of data. We're already collecting it, and in some cases, we are already uh, analyzing it. And we're analyzing it under a condition at Axiom that we call a safe haven. And basically, what the safe haven allows us to do is to take those two pieces, or three pieces, or multiple pieces, if you're talking to telematics companies as an example, multiple, multiple pieces of data. And each of those pieces, which in and of themselves need to be private, are actually anonymized. And they're anonymized. Okay, so wait, 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 wait. Okay. explain that. What do you mean anonymized? Well, how do you anonymize data? How you anonymize data is you take away all or most of what the PII or the personally identifiable information of an individual or vehicle which is attached to that. And then from there you have what is known as the raw data. And from that raw data, you can in turn start to do any of the analytics that is, that is needed to be So performed. in other words, if I get this right, I'm driving in a car and you're collecting data from my navigation system. So you can say, wow, there's going to be a traffic jam because of all these cars, but you can't say, but John McElroy is in the traffic jam. You can just say there's going to be a traffic jam. Is that yeah. a good enough analogy? I would say that's, that's part of an analogy. Another way to even look at it is, as an example, you have um, insurance companies where, uh, and you've seen uh, the progressives and the Geico's of the world, you know, they plug the little box and they pretty much follow your, your vehicle around. Well, that in and of itself is, is done for the purposes of risk management at the insurance companies, but the amount of information that comes out of those little black boxes uh, is enough to be also to be uh, uh, looking at your personal behaviors of what you do with that vehicle. And those in and of themselves need to be private. And so from that perspective, you do need to uh, pull that information out 
And because it's an insurance company, they do have you know those types of information that identifies you and that vehicle as the owner. The, the problem though is privacy um, is a lot easier said than done. We've seen numerous times over the last 10, 15 years where companies have provided um, big caches of data that was supposedly anon anonymized, that was supposed to be used for research purposes. AOL, I think, was one of the first to do it. Other companies have done it. Where if you've got enough data to work with, you can actually start to connect dots. Even if you don't have that personally identifiable information in there, you can connect dots and you can start to track and figure out. And we've seen cases where you know, a reporter took a, you know, look, took a look at this database and was able to figure out from a bunch of disparate pieces of information who this individual was and, tra and call them up for a story they did. Uh, I can't, I, it might have been in the New York Times or somewhere, but, uh, and this was with, with AOL. And it's happened other times as well. So it, it's, not, it's not that easy to actually make data really anonymous. Is that right, Mike? I mean, can you, can you do this? We do it every day. We have a company that we own in California called LiveRamp, and they're our online company. Uh, and Axiom itself was started as an offline company, meaning through direct mail and, and so on back in the 70s and 80s. And so the idea, you, you're, you're sitting there with two disparate forms of information. And at, one, at some point in time, they do need to get put together but also the online information in and of itself is technically anonymous, even though you have a number of uh, digital companies out there that are following you around you know, during your shopping excursions or your information gathering excursions. But once those two pieces are put together, the idea is to gather that online information, anonymize it, and then put it together with the uh, 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 offline information. And doing that right is absolutely legally critical. When you yes. take a look at two separate examples, you have the payment card industry, mm -hmm. where you've got your credit card transactions. We see a lot of hacks in that area. Um, what are they getting? They're getting your credit card number, your home address. Those things are absolutely critical to protect. On the flip side, you have the medical industry, where you might get somebody's personal health records and be able to track them down through kind of details. Those two have shown us how important personalization is to the data, being able to track it down. When you truly anonymize it, you're getting into a situation where any company who is using this system reduces their liability, because the opportunity to have de, um, either de-identified or anonymized data will get them out of a lot of legal trouble and a lot of reporting requirements within the state if a breach does occur. But Sam raises a really good uh, observation here. When you start connecting a lot of different mm -hmm. dots, when you start using big data analytics, artificial intelligence and the like, boy, it can pull all kinds of information out of data that otherwise just looks like a bunch of scattershot stuff. Absolutely, and as long as you really can't tie that down to an individual, it's really good, it's clean data, and, and that's the big risk. But you're right, the more personalized, the more the information that you receive, the more frightening it becomes and the more the risk is when you actually have a breach. What I'm more afraid of is as we move into these technologies that have more uh, facial recognition uh, and more health-related apps in the car, uh, you're really truly starting to get people's faces, you're going to get their health records, and that's when you've got situations where that case of, of a few points of data is going to more quickly lead to finding an individual and that increases the risk and, and that brings in a host of other laws. There are states right now who are passing laws just to protect your health data and those, those states they really do play into the auto industry as we go forward. And you know, we're seeing manufacturers doing research into uh, things for for good, you know, for for very positive reasons. Like you know, for example, a couple of years ago, Ford showed off uh, a driver workload monitoring system that they developed, and other manufacturers have done similar things using sensors in the vehicle to detect uh, your heart rate, your temperature, you know, uh, you know, look at the temperature of your face to see if if perhaps you might be in a stressful situation, you know, traffic, you know, something going on, and and to automatically start to reduce some of the distractions, you know, lower the, the radio volume, things like that. All of those sorts of things are, are being done, you know, with good intent, but it's not, you know, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that it could also be abused uh, because, you know, having that kind of information about your, your physiological state could be correlated to other information as well. And you know, now with things like Cadillac Super Cruise, you have a, a driver monitoring system to make sure that you're still watching the road. You know, so you've got this camera that's looking at your face and there's, there's all kinds of things that could potentially be gleaned from that as well. Are, are automobiles maybe being unfairly singled out 
because we all carry uh, smartphones and they are a massive repository of our own personal data. We're tracked by all kinds of things. Uh, the data coming out of our phones has been monetized since the day we bought it. And here we're putting a real you know, microscope on the automobile. Is it kind of unfair? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's unfair in as much, and this goes back to, uh, I was one of the group who created Uconnect. And at Chrysler. At Chrysler, yes. And that was one of the reasons why when we looked at Uconnect as an, as an item, we looked at it as an extension of an individual. If you try to hard code a system uh, into a vehicle, by the time you're developing it and the vehicle rolls over the curb, you're already three years behind, technologically speaking, from that time of development to the time it gets to the consumer. But if you use the vehicle itself as a facilitation method for whatever personal uh, function that you use to manage your life, it becomes, uh, it becomes less of a problem with the vehicle and much more of whether or not uh, you're able to get those things that are relevant to you as a driver and as a management of your life than it is just of the vehicle uh, in and of itself. Well, and to add to that, there are really two things going on with that whole question. Number one, it's, it's the way that we face the right to privacy. Um, we, we now are so accustomed to our cell phones, giving away all of our information is normal. We want to know how do you get to the, to the closest coffee shop. We want to know where our friends are. We want everyone to check in on Facebook and, and post their location. And that's comfortable. We're, we're happy with that. So our expectations of privacy are, are diminished. Uh, but yet you have a lot of advocacy groups, you have a lot of legislatures, and you have a lot of European countries that are trying to heighten either the transparency or the ability to be forgotten. It's kind of a competition between the right of privacy and the right to be forgotten. And what they want is the ability for someone to disappear and not have their data collected. So it's our ability to be able to filter that information, allow people the choices on what happens to their data that really seems to be the direction that the consumer advocates are moving. I, I was going to say, ironically speaking, uh, there was a recent study that was just completed. 90% of the world's data has been com uh, created in the last 24 months, but most of it is observational. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Sam, Jennifer raises a good point. In Europe, the, the tolerance for sharing data is very different than it uh -huh. is in the United States. Boy, they don't want to share. How does this affect automakers? Are they going to have to develop different systems for different regions in the world? Uh, not necessarily different systems, but the, I think there will have to be different um, <coughs> firewalls, if you will, you know, di different criteria for how, what's collected, what's not, where, how it's shared. Um, you know, so I think you can you can build off the same platforms, but then use it differently or collect it differently. So you can turn things on and off uh, within various systems. And actually, depending on how the the legislation is structured, it may actually turn out that you can't do that. Um, you know, it, there you may not want to leave those switches available in there because there's always, again, there's always the possibility that if something's there, it can be abused by a bad actor. So it. It could go either way, depending on, on how the legislation is set up. Mike, how do you guys handle it at Axion? Well, basically, uh, privacy, governance, and, and, and data in and of itself is a very key part of what differentiates us uh, as a company. Uh, we've been doing this uh, for over 45 plus years. We were one of the first companies out there to actually hire a chief privacy officer before it was even fashionable. And uh, when those that have looked at the way we uh, privatize our, our privacy uh, within our data and the structures in which we follow. Um, most have said we're three years way ahead of everybody else and, uh, and also the way we do it, we also do it in, uh, in uh, concert with our clients. So before we even do anything with their data uh, relative to uh, looking at it, analyzing it, and using it, we ask them what is it that you have in your companies that are uh, either within compliance, within your risk management, and things of those natures. And if they don't hit those pieces, those are parts of the pieces that we have to counsel them on as we're starting to generate any of the uh, products and services that we provide to them. And, and those, those services 
have to provide real value to the customers. You know, I mean, there's a reason why I share a, a tremendous amount of my personal data with Google through my phone because I derive a lot of value from the services that are built off of that data. Um, but I also, I have a fairly high degree of trust that Google is also going to protect that data. I'm, I'm fairly confident that they're, that they're going to keep it secure. I wouldn't necessarily say that about a lot of other companies. And I think that's, that's going to be the key is to make sure that everything, data is secured and held held in confidence to the, to as high a degree as possible. And so cybersecurity in vehicles is in both in vehicles and in the cloud connected to those vehicles is going to be crucial. Yeah, it sure will be. Jennifer, I want to come back to you though on this. Data is so fungible. It's mm -hmm. bits and bytes. It can go all around the world in the flash of a second. Absolutely. So how do you make sure that something that was collected legally in the United States is not illegal in Europe or vice versa? Well, you need to know what laws are, are, are out there, and I think actually having U.S. data go over to Europe is probably far easier than importing it the other direction. Um, the European standards are, are, are significantly more, um, I don't want to say onerous, but they're definitely um, more thought out and currently on paper than our standards. Uh, just look here in the United States. There are 48 states that have data breach and, and data related laws. Uh, if you're in Alabama and South Dakota, you're perfectly fine. There's no reporting, there's no uh, mandates, there's no definitions of personal identifying information. So this whole structure and framework doesn't even exist. So when you're collecting this data, when you're, you're transporting, it, you really need to understand as a company where your data is going, where you're storing it, are you compliant, and, and we really need to hope that you're not going to have to shift your vehicle when you cross state lines into a whole different opt-in, opt-out regime. And that's <laughs> just frightening to think about. <laughs> we'll have border yeah. gates at right. each state well, and, and crossing. I, and I think the companies that are involved in this space, you know, we need to make sure that those companies are res held responsible for Maintenance for securing that data, mm -hmm. you know, and when they when they don't, you know, when they when they don't do their job, then they you know they need to be held accountable for that. Yeah, Mike, and, is it? Oh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. And I was going to say, and when you do do your job, uh, as is the case with our company, the idea is to drive a seamless customer experience, and that way to provide a higher return on investment for whoever uh, the potential clients are. Yes. Mike, we've talked about this growing to be a $450 billion a year, $750 billion a year market. Is it happening now? I mean, can GM collect and monetize data with OnStar? Can Tesla do it with its over-the-air capabilities? Absolutely. Uh, any company, again, as I had said at the beginning, any company that at least has a relative functional uh, experienced database that exists within their company, then there are some uh, there are some uh, key things that need to be done at least to uh, ingest it, uh, what we call taxonomy, uh, itemize it, privatize it, and then at the end of the day, you have to find a distribution uh, level to that. In fact, we as a company have that capability to do that from A to Z because of how we've been doing this for a number of years. And if you look at the data in and of itself, there was a recent study done by the Internet Advertising Bureau that said uh, data-driven marketing in general has provided about 10.4 million jobs and put about another 1.1 trillion into the U.S. economy alone. Data-driven advertising. Data-driven advertising. So when I do a search for something on my phone or laptop and all the ads keep popping up for days afterwards, that's what you're talking about? Yeah, as part of that as well as if, uh, if an individual company is already um, uh, taking their data and using it for the good of either uh, finding a consumer, uh, uh, making that consumer loyal to their brand, or uh, uh, trying to get them to uh, repurchase uh, either a subscription or a service, especially on connected vehicles, uh, then that becomes uh, part of that uh, particular cycle. But Sam, who's going to get this money? I mean, is it going to be the car companies? What about if I'm a tier one supplier and I made some of the componentry that goes into, can I collect some of that data? Who's going to get it? Um, it's mostly uh, the OEMs, but also uh, com companies, data brokerage platforms, uh, like what uh, Delphi earlier this year announced an investment in Autonomo. They're a data brokerage platform that collect and aggregate the data and make it available to third party service providers. Uh, Ericsson with their connected vehicle marketplace. IBM is doing something with Watson with, with BMW. So these, these platforms that are aggregating the data are, you know, they're also another one that'll make money, as well as some of the service providers that are 
ingesting that data, taking that data from these platforms and then providing services back, uh, they'll, you know, they'll also generate revenue from that. So everybody except us. Yeah. We, <laughs> we, yeah, got, exactly. I'm working to change that and I'll explain in a minute. Yeah. Well, I was, yeah, I was going to add on to that as, as Sam had said, uh, relative to the services, you have uh, industries such as the insurance industry, mm -hmm. as an example, are looking for ways to make their uh, policyholders uh, you know, become more comfortable with uh, using them. And as a case in point, and we have a number of them coming to us for the recalls, they want to, they want to uh, start providing services for vehicles in, in which if the automotive company wasn't able to reach them relative to uh, a particular recall, then the insurance companies are, are raising their hands now saying they want to provide that as a method to make sure that one, their policyholders know about it, two, they become safe, and then also three, it's a risk benefit for all of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the automakers make money, the suppliers make money, the data brokers make money, Axiom makes money. <laughs> I want to make money, it's my data. <laughs> Jennifer, can't, if we can anonymize data, can't mm -hmm. we give a little code that says, hey, this is John McElroy's data, and I get a check at the end of every month from all the money that somebody's been making off my data. It sounds like a great plan, and what's even more interesting is there are a lot of state laws, uh, there are more than 17 states, that say that you own that data, the, the data relative to you. So your ability to, to sign off and, and collect, that's an entirely different thing. That's that fine print when you take a look and, and you see that you're licensing the rights, they can continue to make whatever money they want off of it, but it's still your data, so in theory, if you could find somebody who would buy your little you know, descript piece, you might be able to make a couple pennies here. You, you probably won't get any cash, but you know, you'll, you may save some money on your insurance premiums uh, <laughs> by you know, getting deals on, on oil changes and things like that. You may I save some money. I want that and I want to check every month. So I'm throwing that out to the audience. I know there's a genius out there that's going to figure it out. Maybe it's going to take blockchain or something to do it, but we're <laughs> going to get to the bottom of this. Look, we're going to have to wrap up this discussion. Really good one. Jennifer, Mike, Sam, I want to thank all three of you for coming in and yeah. talking all about where this data stuff is going. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thanks, John. Appreciate of course, it. I got to thank all of you for having tuned in.